Hi, everyone, and welcome. I'm super happy to be here with you all this morning, virtually. Um, I'm going to get started right away. I'm Tracy. Welcome here. So I'm here. It's got a kind of a funny name, flexible, not only about space. Part of this came from a lot of conversations with people about how to create a flexible learning environment and um, a lot of focus on kind of furniture and space and where to put things. And then a lot of my thinking has to go, OK, well, what do we do beyond that? What, why are we doing this? And how do we move into kind of a flexible way of thinking in terms of um, accessibility and flexibility for our students' learning process? So I've already done this introduction. I'm Tracy. This is where I work. Um, I live in Jojage, Montreal, which uh, and I benefit greatly from living here. This area has been um, uh, traditionally cared for by the Ganigahaga people, or, or just Ganigahaga nation um, in Ganawage and Ganasatage, which kind of surround or hold the island of Montreal on either side. Um, one of the things that I've been trying to do for the last, I guess it's two years now, is to ensure that the work I do falls in line with the spirit of competency 15. I'm not gonna go into a history of what that is. There is a workshop later this, later this morning if you wanna learn more about competency 15. Once I give you the link to this um, um, presentation, you can see on the screen, there's like this little arrow with the document. You can read about competency 15, but basically it's about valuing and promoting indigenous knowledge, worldviews, cultures, and history within education, within our which in our teaching and learning practices. So I chose three, just the highs are the ones that I'm consciously thinking of as I work through, as we work together. Um, but I'm not going to go into detail, but really it's around creating this kind of this, a learning environment that promotes respect and is welcoming, incorporating Indigenous ways of teaching and learning, and this idea of a continuous learning process that we're always learning. And, and that's really what I'm, I'm I'm hoping to model here today. My goals, the beginning, I'm gonna be talking a little bit. <laughs> People who know me, I may be talking a lot, but I'll be talking a bit. Um, I'm gonna be presenting the course that I was talking, that I mentioned in the description, the Balanced Health Curriculum, as well as some ideas around it in terms of flexible approach to learning. And then I'd, uh, we're gonna have some time to talk with each other about some of those ideas. A little bit of history around balanced health. So the balanced health curriculum was um, first presented to me by Diane. She's a, a colleague of mine. We work closely together um, at the, the FNA ESC, First Nations Adult Education School Council. We have too many acronyms in adult ed, so I try not to use them, but sometimes I do. So this course, when she gave it to me, was, was just a, like a, a Word document. It was based on Indigenous ways of learning, Indigenous content. Um, it was a way to integrate Indigenous content into local courses so that students could get some, some options, electives. Um, and she approached me and asked me, you know what, I have this idea for a course where, you know, it could be kind of flexible. Students could, learners could um, get one credit or maybe four credits, depending on how deep they go into the course. Um, could you help me with creating a website and finding some resources? And that's where it all started. So that's a bit of the background. Oh, and then, and then I went ahead and I kind of developed a website for it. I even started translating it. That was more recent. Um, everything here is bilingual just because I, I'll be presenting in English, but maybe there are some people who prefer to read in French and this way it's just easier for everyone. Um, so I, I, I built a website and I found all these resources and I realized something's missing. Like this is, it's um, something's missing. It's like this collection of resources, right? And so these are, um, excuse me, this is just to show kind of this. There were, I had these collections of resources around the four themes, which were the four potential courses that people could take, but something wasn't hooking it all together. So that's where kind of this, this journey around flexibility started terms of competency developed, development. At the same time, I'm also working on a project within vocational training. Um, it's a pilot program, this hybrid construction trades curriculum in one of our, the, the communities that um, 
the school council supports. We support communities across the territory of Quebec. Um, at the moment, we have adult education centers in Listigouge. We have some people from Listigouge here. We have adult ed centers in uh, uh, Gascapegiac, Pessimit, which is more North Shore, um, Val d'Or, Lac Simon, Picogan, which is up near Val d'Or, Ganawagi, Ganasatagi, and the Montreal Urban Center. And we have other communities joining on as well. So this was based on community needs in Gascapegia, where they wanted to develop capacity within construction trades. And but the thing is, in a small community, the way that it works, like you know, in a, in a large center, is you have a program and you have a cohort of people, and they are all learning the same thing, right? Like you have people that are coming into, uh, like, well, I'm, I'll just use construction trades as an example, and they all learn how to become a carpenter, or they all learn how to become what it, a plumber. In a small community, you don't need a cohort of 10 or 20 plumbers, right? You might need one. You need to have a cohort of people who could potentially build a house together and do all of the parts that is um, involved in that, including like the, the project management, you know, so the contractor, like all the different pieces. So we wanted to create something that will respond to that need. So you've got individual pathways within the cohort potentially multiple qualifications for learners, and I'll go into that in a minute, but really based on community needs. Within Gescapegiac, as, as it's true for many smaller communities, there's a housing shortage, a big housing shortage, and so um, this was a need to build houses. Since then, the need, <laughs> the, 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 it has grown. They're building houses and chalets and, and pavilions, but that was the beginning need. And what's interesting about this program is that generally in a school board, the students, the learners will um, learn how they learn the, the different skills that they need to learn on kind of these mock things, right? They they build these mock things within a warehouse or something, and then they tear them down at the end. They're building homes. They're building chalets that people are going to be using. So it's interesting. So I talked about the multiple potential multiple qualifications. We're building it as a three-tiered program. They start off learning within a semi-skilled type program where they're actually doing an initiation to different construction trades. And then as they move up through a skills training certificate and then into a, um, a, a DVS or a diploma of vocational study, I'm in semi-skilled, I can get a job and I'm happy with that. Or do they want to continue and specialize in a school skills training certificate? Or do they want to even continue further and go ahead and get their DVS? And even then, within the DVS, they could branch off. And so they could choose uh, plumbing, electricity, whatever it is that they want to learn and focus on, that's where it's going to go. That, that's where they're going to go. And we will support them in that. So that was the inspiration. Initially, we were working within kind of the constraints in a sense of, that's the word, the boundaries of four courses, right? If I go back and I look at my, here, so PHA 5041, now these are all AGE, these are all adult ed courses. So this is like a phys ed course, emotional wellness as a personal development, personal development, and a commitment to success course. So we were really working within those. And, but I asked myself, and, I, and, and speaking with um, Diane, and I also met, um, uh, had a, like a day with Curran, who's, who's going to be presenting later on today as well, Curran Jacobs, about, well, how can we really push the boundaries of what we're given as course uh, programs and courses from the MEQ to really make sure that they meet the needs of our learners and communities? And this idea of learning being student-led, student-centered is very much folds very nicely, not nicely, but folds really well into this indigenous pedagogy where really we're starting from the, the student within a community. So it's the learner's needs within the needs of the community. Um, okay, we're about to, we're about to get started on, yeah, I think, and, and you know what, Gail, actually, thank you for saying that, because I, I, I've been wanting to remember to say this. Very often when I talk about, or when, when we talk about Competency 15, if you don't know about it, really read it, it's wonderful. Um, 
uh, we talk about indigenous pedagogy. We're, we need to say that, yes, this is indigenous pedagogy, yet at the same time, we're doing a disservice, I feel, because this is good pedagogy all around. And we have so much to learn from, so much to learn about different ways of approaching learning and teaching, that I am not the expert as a teacher. And that's really helpful when we're teaching multiple subjects and we're asked to teach something that we're not experts in, right? So that mindset, but even if it is something that I've been teaching forever, like I'm a, I've been teaching since for a long time, I don't uh, 20 uh, something years, like since 1996. And for most of that time, I've been working in special education. Am I an expert? I don't think so, but some people might because I have, uh, I have some coursework done on it. I have a lot of experience in it who have the needs and they're teaching me how to help them. And so part of that is, is, is very much integrated into indigenous pedagogy and, and, but it's not only for indigenous people. So competency 15, I remember when I first learned about it, it was when it was launched. And one of the, um, um, one of the, uh, the facilitate, one of the people involved in creating it said, you know, this competency, it's for if you teach indigenous students or not, if you work in an indigenous community or not, it's for everybody and it will benefit everybody. So um, um, you can, if you have a phone or something, just dial, and I noticed that they offer this now, so it's got the little bit.ly symbol in the middle, but that will bring you to um, a website that has this um, presentation, as well as something else that I'll be looking at in a moment. And jot it down, because I'm going to be moving from this slide. It's bit.ly slash flex not space. Okay, so I'm moving from the slide now. Um, so those are the workshop resources. It's the website, as well as this brainstorming document that I'm going to look at now. So balanced health. So once again, let me continue to contextualize this. Diane came to me with this idea for a curriculum that she was banging around. At the same time, we were looking at flexible approaches to competency attainment and to competency development in our, carp in our um, pilot carpentry program. And then I, and, and I was feeling like, okay, I've found all these resources and I made a pretty website, but there's something missing. And so here we go. Now I start brainstorming. What if competency development was based on choice? So what does that mean? And I call it an, an exploration of choice-based competency development via ambiguous backwards design. <laughs> so I call it ambiguous because we don't necessarily know what the end is going to look like. Within the, yeah, within balanced health, are they going to choose to focus on uh, physical health and maybe look at diabetes or healthful ways of, of eating? Are they going to choose to look at mental health? Are they going to, you know, like, what are they, we don't know what they're going to choose because it's based on student choice. So that's why I call it ambiguous. But what we do know is that there is an assignment, okay? So if we start with the end of mine, we have three paths right now in this curriculum, okay? You can do a four credit course that has a final integrated project, a two credit course, which would be a more focused project, but it's not integrated for like all of the different subjects, or just an individual one credit course that they do a little bit of research, research and they have a final assignment. But all of it is based on learner choice within this wheel of learning. The topics they choose could possibly determine the competencies they develop. I say possibly, because this is me brainstorming with, uh, by, you know, by myself a lot, with Diane, with um, Corinne. So for example, this is what it could look like. This project at the end, final project, to create and present, and it's the presentation that's gonna be actually assessed, an integrated wellness plan for all four aspects of the curriculum. So we get the, the, that you can see in the little circle. But your plan has to include concrete actions and a specific audience. Is this a plan for me? Is it a plan for my community? Is it a plan for someone I know? 
Like, for example, I had said earlier, maybe I choose um, diabetes that I'm really more interested in. It's, you know, it's the impact on uh, my community, because maybe there are a lot of people in my community who have diabetes and how can we change lifestyles, right? So maybe I'll make a plan for that. Depending on how deep I go into it and how many different, maybe I'm looking at all all of the different aspects how is diabetes connected to emotional wellness to spiritual wellness cognitive wellness all of that then i'd make this integrated plan and that can be a four credit course if i do only just woof, one section that would be two and if i do the research it's it's one credit and so if it's based on choice we've got this idea of learner choice learner centered flexible holistic it's relevant to the learner uh, and so I started thinking this, this could be impactful for the learning that happens within community. And maybe there's a common set of competencies, like in CST 5004, that's doing a project. So there, you know, so, that, so you have this kind of common uh, competency that could help to frame. But if they decide to work on healthy lifestyle, then they would develop competencies within the, phys the physical, I, I don't remember what the acronym PHA stands for, but like physical education competency, competency three adopts a healthy list. <clears throat> and then I found some other possible competencies from different programs. Now, again, this is all adult ed uh, program competency work, but this could be done in, in a, um, a long, uh, in anything, because this is, this was that inspired by the work that we were doing um, on the carpentry, where they've pulled together all of the competencies They've added, it's actually a 31 competency program right now. They've added competencies. So you've got your technical competencies, which come from the program, the actual carpentry skills. Plus we have the personal competencies, which is that there are the things like, you know, working in a team and, and, and showing up on time and keeping things clean, et cetera. And then they also have competencies related to the seven grandfather teachings, which are uh, cultural values within the community as well as mentorship competencies. So they are dealing with a lot of competencies that they're tracking. So this is, even though I'm using um, adult education competencies here, vocational, borrowed from vocational. So this is the beginning of my brainstorming. As you can see, I'm still working on it, but I wanted to share that. I said, one of my goals was I wanted to, we, to, to have conversations and to talk to each other. With 20 people, it's really hard to have a conversation because the larger the group, the fewer people speak. So I'm gonna be creating some breakout rooms and you'll, I'll, I'll just let you select which room you go to. Um, I'll make five breakout rooms. So we can have four or five people. I think four is a nice, a nice uh, number for a conversation. and. Um, what I'm gonna ask you is, I'm gonna make sure that you have access, that you have this presentation opened up somewhere on your computer or that there's at least somebody who has this presentation on their computer in your group so that you can go through these questions together. There's um, one, two, three, four, like four questions, you don't have to, you don't have to talk about all of them. You can talk about one. You can talk about something else related to flexible, this idea of what? Students choose their competencies? Like, how is that possible? Like you, half the time students don't even know what competencies they're working towards, right? They're just doing the course, they're doing a book. They, what are the comp? So this is a, a way to also make those, their work really relevant to them and they're see what, what it is that they're working towards and that they can choose it. But what do we need to do for that? There's still so much to talk about. So I'm gonna create those breakout rooms now. So you can continue these conversations this afternoon. Um, for the last, like we have like nine minutes, um, I, I would love to hear some, some reflections. Like maybe you had a chance to talk about, um, um, if you, it doesn't matter if it was about the questions that I gave you, I was really giving starting points and things that I thought people might, you know, just to frame things, but maybe you started talking about something else, that's fine. So I'm just, so would anyone like to, thoughts that came out of your conversations? Edmund and I, we were kind of trying to find out how to approach the indigenous 
I don't want to say problems, but communities or issues that they may have. And uh, we both ended up saying that it's difficult to do it from the outside and it really should be done from within the communities. And maybe we could be just, you know, resource people or some kind of have a bystanding position, but you know, there's a whole different culture that needs to be revitalized. And uh, yeah, so was, and that's I would, how it ends. And I would think that one of the reasons for competency 15 is just that, is that there's not a, um, we don't know what to do, right? Because we know that um, like it's, we've been separate for so long. We've been, we've been, you know, the school boards and then there's the communities. But I think that the first start is not just to say it has to be done by the communities. We have to go out and, and connect with someone in a community that's close to us. Like I live in Montreal, Jojage. So I would go, if I, if I was uh, developing a program for the English Montreal School Board, I would reach out to the Ganawadi Education Center and say, is there something that, you know, I'd like some help. Is there something that, that, um, that we can collaborate on, I have an idea. Not expecting them to do all the work, but that we're consulting. And if you are consulting, if you are going out to a school board and consulting, uh, you know, ask, uh, sorry, if you are in a school board and going to a community and consulting, it's really important to, to offer something, you know, a re like a reimbursement for the consultation. It's not free work. Right, just like we would pay an external consultant anywhere. You have someone coming in to work on a PLCs, you know, professional learning communities or whatever it is. You're, we're paying them, right? So the same thing with indigenous communities. Don't think, oh, you know, they'll be happy to help. No, no, it's like a, it's it's they need to be compensated um, appropriately as well. But I think that reaching out to community resources is a huge, it's a big start. We can't just say, oh, it has to happen there. It's kind of like the same thing as when we're, you know, we're saying, um, well, they should have known this by now. Like when we're, we're teaching grade 11 and they still don't know how to write a five paragraph essay. I don't know, I'm, I'm, you know, the, or sec five, or they're, you know, they should know this by now. Well, we, we need to make connections with other people and focus on the learner and what is it they need. But thank you, I think that's a really, really important point. We don't know where to start. And so competency 15 actually helps a lot in that area. Anyone else have something from their conversation that came out around this idea of even just like a knee jerk reaction to student, like learner centered competency development. Go ahead, Gwen. So I love the idea. I've We've implemented it a little bit here at New Horizons. Where we're struggling is we have ministry exams. Right, it's great to individualize everything, but what happens when they get to the exams? And how do you individualize it for 30 different individuals? Like that, like it's great when it's a whole class, you pick one project, but when there's 30 different projects, how do you help them all get to where they need to be as well as be ready for those ministry exams? So that's just something that I'm thinking about. I'm trying to figure out how to get them there and if any answers, please share them my way. <laughs> and and that's a um, that's a that is the concern across the board. No matter what we're doing, technology integration, differentiation, uh, UDL, uh, the flexible learning, uh, student-led competency development. It's the same thing for this particular course and these types of this this kind of thing. It's um, they're non-ministry exams, right? So. That, that's that's one thing um and for the ministry exams very often we get so caught up with the ministry exams that we're worried about them whereas if we if we're working with our learners on how to learn and build capacity within them the ministry exam becomes almost a technicality and it's it's like personal anecdote um i'm a i homeschool my son for the first, last year was the first year the ministry required homeschoolers to write ministry exams, um, which kind of defeats the whole purpose of homeschooling in a sense. Like, <laughs> But um, so he has to go to the English Montreal School Board at the board office, write an exam with consultants. I am not allowed anywhere near the room, even though I'm a certified teacher and I'm the one who's been teaching him all year. 
I'm not allowed in with him, not even for the prep. He's going for a preparatory thing. I'm not allowed in. And he's not allowed to take a picture of anything or take notes. It's completely, anyways, yeah. But I'm not teaching necessarily to the exam, but I'm teaching him how to tell a story because grade six English language arts is a narrative exam. I'm teaching him how to tell a story. I'm teaching him how to respond to what he reads. And these are things that he needs to know anyways. And that, that happens to be the exam. So all of this to say, sometimes we focus so much on those exams or as if we're building competency. I don't know, but also these courses are not ministry courses. I have, okay. Anything, but thank you. That's that's definitely, that's that's a preoccupation all the time. I'm going to let you go on your break unless there's someone who would like to add something really that they feel they would like to add at this point. Abby? I'm see a logistic. First off, thank you, Tracy. And thanks for giving everyone a chance to speak in the breakout rooms.